call from all the things of this world and you made him your son. You called him by name and he served you with everything in them. We thank you. Hallelujah. To the King of Kings, Lord, there's a promise. And on that resurrection morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, we will see Carl again. I thank you for his life. I thank you for all the love that he gave each one of us. And now, Lord, you are the comforter. I ask in the way that only you can do it. Comfort us, Father. Abba, Father, comfort us now. For we know that your ways are not our ways. But you have a plan, and we honor you today. We honor the great I am. We know who you are, and we trust you. Our hearts may be broken, but we love you, and we trust you. Now, Lord, have your way in this service as we honor you and as you receive your son into glory where he is now, we too want to be. Get your glory in this service through every song, through every prayer, through every tear that you bottle. Get your glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I am Mary Ann Dunn, a.k.a. Mom to Carl Schuessler. Carl had a very special place in my heart. In the year was the summer of 1998, Louisiana camp meeting in Tioga, Louisiana, and I got a call from Sister Kim Johnson, who was with Flo Ben Stevens, now Flo Shaw, called me and Kim said, Sister Dunn, we have a young man here who's very sick and I think he needs a place just to rest. And I said, well sure, Kim, bring him on down. And in walks Carl Schusler. Carl Schusler became my son that day. He walked in my home, and he walked in my heart, and my husband's heart, and a relationship began. We kept Carl through many because of the times, many camp meetings, and um, we also delivered him out of the hands of his enemies when he had plans to marry, but we do. Moms know. Okay, moms know. So uh, Carl calls me up. He has a great sense of humor. He goes, Mom. And I said, yeah, Carl, what's going on? He said, how do you feel about a lot of wives? I said, now, Carl, she's like, you know better than that. You're not Abraham, right? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, Carl? He said, well, you know, we've been all praying about who I'm going to marry. He said, and um, I had uh, three sisters from the church come up. And each one of them were praying. And each one of them said, God told them I'm to be their wife. I said, let me tell you something, son. None of the above are your wife. <laughs> so it was things and times happen. But we seriously began to pray about who Carl Schussler was going to marry. We all felt like his mom. And so through the prayers, I got another call. Mom, what's up, Carl? He said, I think I got the one. I said, you got the one, one what? He said, I think I got my future wife. I said, Carl Schusler, give, give me the rundown, what is it? He said, well, he said a lot of beautiful things about Pam. And I said, uh, how long she's been in the church? <laughs> and uh, he said, do you know who she is? And I said, no. And then that's when the demergence names came up. And they said, who Pam Schusler, Pam DeMerchant was. I said, well, we're going to go pray. I said, I already like her. I said, I think she's the one already because she comes from good stock. And we started praying. And we prayed. 
and we prayed. And we all came up with the same thing. Yes, bingo, it's going to be Pam. And then in rides Pam into all of our hearts. Pam, there's not enough words that I can say and thank you. You've been a loving wife. You've been passionate about the Lord. There's so many things I can say from my heart, but there's one thing that I know that's going to happen because I'm there as a widow. You've known Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. You've known him as your deliverer. You've known him as your protector. But there's going to be an anointing that comes that you will now know Jesus Christ as your husband because he becomes a husband to the widow. The empty spaces that you have in your heart, he's going to fill it with such love, such purpose. You'll always love Carl. You'll always carry the memories. But the relationship is changing. Your covenant with Carl is over. But your covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ will always be there. I want to close in saying if Carl were here, what he would say. And um, I did. I don't do Facebook, folks, but I had someone look up Carl's last post. And I want to take an excerpt from it because it gives you an insight to how courageous Carl Schusler was and what he thought about everything. But before I read that, I want to share something. Carl Schusler told me about many of you. His heart was so big that not one of you could take the place of the other one. There's a special place in Carl's heart for each one of you. The prayers he's prayed, the love he has for you, each one of you were very dear and very special to him. And the tears and the prayers will live on, each one of them. He loved his family. He loved them very, very much. Every brother and sister was a part of Carl Schusler and made him who he is. So as I leave, I want to leave something that Carl would say if Carl was here. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Carl Schusler's words now. If the entire world falls apart, which it will, before the reign of Christ on earth, until then, we must put our trust in him and him alone. The word of God tells us that Christ's disciples and true followers will govern this earth when he returns. And it will be done with true, true justice, a rule of God's law. In the meantime, we must submit to him and his word and just know that there's a lot of craziness coming down the road. Isn't this cool? There's a lot of craziness coming down the road until then. So we must have faith in God and know that he has everything in control. I pray his word helps someone today. Little thing he drew in his artwork was have faith in God. We love him, we'll never forget him, and we're all better people because Carl Schusler loved with such deepness. When you saw Carl, you saw Jesus, and his love will always be with us, it will never die. God bless you all. Reverend Carl Allen Schusler was born on October 21st. 21st, 1964, in Texas City, Texas, 
was adopted at birth by Captain Charlie and Ezra, Ezra Schuster. He passed away unexpectedly on November 7, 2020. Surviving were his lovely wife, Pamela DeBurchett Schuster, brothers Captain Chuck Schuster, Captain Butch Schuster, and Wayne Pennington, along with nieces and nephews. He was preceded in death by his father, Captain Charlie Schuster, Mother Ezra Gray Schuster, sisters Emma Thompson and Shirley Zingrabe. The Carl graduated from Sam Rayburn High School and earned a certificate from San Jacinto College in cooking. He then went on to start two restaurants, Oregano's and the local Carlo. The Carl loved architecture and design and used his creative talent anywhere to express it. Flyers, business cards, websites, landscaping, architecture, etc. In 2010, he started the Authentic Revival Church in downtown Houston, pastoring for almost five years. He loved to travel and traveled internationally to Spain, Portugal, Mexico, England, Brazil, and Canada. He had a great love for people, was a cherished friend and encourager to many, and he loved to entertain. Amen. He was so thankful that God saved him and gave him a purpose in life. He enjoyed sharing his testimony with everyone he met, and he will be dearly missed. And he will be dearly missed. If you're wondering if it doesn't seem like a funeral in here, well, there's a reason for that. I know that we're sad in our hearts, there are many broken hearts today, but there's also a sense of victory, knowing that Carl has overcome the final obstacle. I first met Carl at Life Tabernacle in 1994. I remember him walking into the foyer of the church, and uh, he was walking and walking somewhat stiffly, but he was there. And I guess if you could say anything about Carl is that. Wherever he was going, he was going to get there. Yeah. One way or another. And it's such a blessing and privilege to say that he was my friend. And I don't even like to use the word was because Carl has never been more alive than he is today. He is my friend and I will see him again. We will all see him again one day. That's the beautiful promise that we have. A promise that cannot be shaken. We will see him again. And it's such a privilege and I'm humbled today because I'm talking about a man that was so unique. And so just his life was a living, breathing testimony to every one of us here. There's not one person here that cannot say that Carl did not inspire you. Carl did not have a significant impact on your life. Even though he was crippled in body, he was limited physically, it didn't stop him from reaching and touching as many people as he could. In fact, I don't know of anything that could stop Carl once he set his mind to it. I remember when I first saw him, he told me he was seeking the Holy Ghost. And it took him a while, but he got it. Because I knew Carl, he was going to get it. <laughs> he was going to get it. But underneath that tough, that strong determination, amen, there was a kindness. A kindness. His love for people. And Carl loved people. He loved people. And wherever people were, that's where Carl was. That's where he wanted to be. And he has such a love for people's hearts and such a great sense of humor. I remember all the times we would call and talk on the phone and just laugh at one another and tell our bad jokes and, and, and just go back and forth. And, and of all the wonderful attributes of this man, the most I remember is his determination. His determination. All that, all that passion and all that determination 
but limited by a body crippled by disease. He would convict me. It takes determination to start a church. It takes a lot of determination to start a church in downtown Houston. And it takes even more determination to start a church in downtown Houston in a wheelchair. I define that as success. This is what you call a successful life. Not monetary value. He didn't have good health, but that was all washed away by what he accomplished and the inspiration and the life that he lived in front of others and so many that he inspired. He was a living testimony that God's grace is sufficient and more than sufficient, but overflowing and able to take a life that seemed without purpose. He could have been bitter. He could have been angry. He could have withdrawn. He could have turned to a lot of things. He could have gone in many, many different directions when he found out he was diagnosed, but he didn't do that. He knew where to go, and when he did, the Spirit of God moved through him. And he was a, 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 a beautiful, beautiful life. And I was privileged to say he was my friend. And that determination and that zeal that consumed him, and I watched him. <laughs> You could be wore out. Jeff and I were talking about this. We could be wore out. We, we were healthy. And here he was. He was ready to go another round. He was ready to just charge ahead. We're not done yet. Let's do this. And he would tell you, I need you to come over here and do this. I need you to do that. Could you do this for me? Could you do that for me? <laughs> if we could impart that same zeal and that same determination into the hearts of many healthy people. We could turn Houston upside down. And he never complained. Never. I, I lived with him for a little while. Never complained. Never complained about his condition. I always believed that God was going to heal him. Well, God has healed him. He has received complete healing today. And he knew everybody. I mean, he knew everybody. I, I, I was looking for President Trump while I walked in. <laughs> where's the heads of state? Where's, where's, where's the mayor? Where's the governor? He knew everybody. And that's because he loved people. But that determination, he was like blind or amazed. He wasn't going to quit. He wasn't going to stop. Even though they tell him to be quiet, he wasn't going to. He, like the woman with the issue of blood, she had an infirmity. She had to press through the crowd. In spite of her infirmity, that was Carl. I'm going to get a hold of the throne. I'm going to get a hold of Jesus. And this crippled body is not going to stop me from doing a work for God. He was Jacob wrestling with the angel. I'm not letting go until you bless me. He was Caleb saying, Give me this mountain. He's got his mountain today. And he's standing on it. He's not in a wheelchair. And I promise you right now, he's jumping and he's leaping for joy. And he's jumping higher than anybody in heaven right now. And he's running faster than anybody in heaven right now. Jesus spoke of putting all things under his feet. And every obstacle, every sickness, every pain, every difficulty has been put under Carl's feet today. He has conquered every enemy now there ever was to conquer. Every giant he ever faced in this world. He's overcome every single one of them right now. And the impact that he has had is immeasurable. And the love that we have for him is immeasurable. Because each one of us, he affected us in so many different ways. But the greatest thing that he could do, that he did for each one of us, is tell us 
through his life that you can make it. You can make it. You can not only make it, but you can thrive. You can live for God. You can do a work for God. And no obstacle that can come against you is going to put a stop to you. And that was the great message of his life. And he proved it every day. We honor him today. We honor this great man. This great man. And I don't use that word lightly. Because anyone that can live his life with the spirit that he had, it's only the grace of God and the greatness of our God that allowed him to do that. So today, it's a bittersweet day because we're sad. But for him, he's at his final place of joy and peace and rest. God bless you. I say thank you to Brother Leatherwood and those who have spoken here today. What a tremendous eulogy. I think that the words are easy to come at a time like this for a man like Paul Schuster. It doesn't take us long to think of something to say. I have preached funerals where I had a hard time having something good to say. I would like to begin this today by asking all of the ministers who are here today, if you're a minister of the gospel, would you stand? I thank God for this good representation. What a blessing. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I met Carl Schusler at a district conference approximately 10 years ago. I knew him, but I never really interacted with him very much. It was late at night, and he was in the lobby of the, the executive inn and suites there in San Marcos, Texas. We started talking and he said, uh, could you help me? He said, uh, do you have some jumper cables? He said, my, I've, I've run the battery down on my, on my van. And that started a decade of friendship. We went out and got his, I found out how fancy that man was and with all of the apparatus that he needed to be able to drive it. It, you know, we instantly connected. And Brother Schusler had a way of, of connecting with you and making you feel that you're very important to him. And I kind of have a feeling that every person who knew him felt like they were one of his best friends. That's the kind of man he was. But you know, we interacted a lot after that. Uh, he became a great friend. Uh, just a short time later, I became presbyter of the section that he was a part of, and the birth of his church uh, was there in the little, our, our section was a pie shed that 
and down toward downtown Houston. And he was in the narrowest part of our section. And, and we had a great relationship. I think I preached his second anniversary in that church. I was there for a home mission seminar and on several occasions. The thing is, I was amazed when I came there at the excellence with which everything was done. It wasn't like a helper skelter. I've been in a lot of home missions churches where it kind of seemed like it was just, you know, put together. And, and I'm not saying that's bad, but Brother Schusler ran this like a, I mean, it, it was a well-oiled machine. He didn't, he didn't act like he was worried about anything. The graphics and the advertisements and the visitor cards and everything he had it just absolutely to perfection. You know, the authentic revival church was still in his heart. He wanted to continue that work and, and we had hoped to see that happen out this way somewhere in the, the vast unchurched areas that in this uh, region of Houston. But God knows. Everything he did, he did a great job. You know, there's some notable things that I, I just, this morning, real early, I started really thinking about him. His personality was so large that his handicap was not noticed. I mean, it just, I never thought about it. It was like, you know, and he had one of the coolest wheelchairs I'd ever seen <laughs> that could make him as tall as anybody there. You, know? just, you wasn't going to look down on Carl Schuster. I mean, he was, he, he'd just raise that thing right up and look you square in the eye. You know? And, and it, this was so awesome. He never complained about his struggle with his illnesses and the many different things that he had gone through. But this debilitating disease that he had. He was a servant. He was a servant in, and he was a servant, I think, from the beginning of his walk with God. He had that attitude. I found out, you know, some things about him. As Presbyter, I, we were close and we talked pretty often. And, and uh, but when I became superintendent, he, he called me and he said, uh, Brother Foss, uh, I'm not interested in the limelight. I don't really want my name mentioned, but I'll help you do anything that you need. He said, I have the time and I have the ability to do a lot of things. Well, you know, uh, when I was elected, Brother Bernard told me first thing you've got to do is develop a, a growth plan for the district. And so I'm a little overwhelmed at that uh, thought uh, so quickly. And he said, you need to do it. And they, you know, headquarters started giving me deadlines for submitting that to them. And so I started, uh, Brother Schusler called me and he said, uh, I, I'll help you. He said, if, you're, if you need to write something, I can help you write. He said, I was a ghostwriter for Brother Kilgore for a long time. And I, he, he said, I did that. And I don't know if I'm telling something that Brother Kilgore wouldn't like, but they're both gone. I don't think it matters. <laughs> but I was, <laughs> I, I was the editor of the Texas Sentinel under Brother Kilgore's leadership for a couple of years. And, and a lot of the articles, Brother Kilgore had to submit an article every, every 30 days. And uh, looking back on it now, I know that Carl was involved in that. I'm sure Brother Kilgore gave him whatever thought he had, and Carl fleshed it out, and Brother Kilgore polished it up, and 
and sent it to me. And that's kind of the way it was. But he was willing to do that for me. He said, any writing you need to do, anything you need, I'll, I'll be glad to help. And so when I finally came up with the uh, with my uh, plan, I did send it to him. And he did work with it. And he did uh, help me some. And I appreciated this man and his willingness to do absolutely anything to help in the kingdom of God. <coughs> He had a great burden for North American missions, and that was in his heart. He loved North American missions. He remained our missions director for the section that I'm still a part of uh, until today, or this earlier this week. He was still that. Now, I recently went through the problem of having COVID and uh, during that period of time he wrote me a letter and you know about the transfer the UPC the computer will transfer you if you submit an address that's part of another district and he, he wrote me and I had intended to talk with him this week uh, to try to get whatever he wanted to do about that but you know what he transferred to a place that's so much better than the Texas district or the South Texas district. Right, amen. And what a powerful, powerful thing that has happened to him. When I'm close, when someone close to me goes into the arms of the Lord, I always feel like that I'm close to eternity. It feels like we brush up against it. And today, I think that Brother Schusler has touched us in such a way, it makes us want to go to heaven even more. And I can't, I can't wait to see him for the first time in my life walking. That is going to be an awesome sight. What a wonderful man. I spoke with Brother Jeff Story who, of course, is the district superintendent of the Texas district about this service. And so I'm going to make a presentation today to Sister Pam Schusler on behalf of our district and the Texas district. And in honor of Brother Schusler, I have a flag that we're going to present to Sister Schusler today. To Sister Schusler, in honor of Brother Carl Schusler's years as a minister of the United Pentecostal Church International, on behalf of the entire UPCI fellowship, this flag being presented to you, Sister Schusler, is the official flag of the United Pentecostal Church International and was flown over the World Evangelism Center in Weldon Springs, Missouri. On the face of this flag is the portrayal of the world floating in a sea of blue. At the center is a cross and a crown symbolizing both our walk with Jesus Christ and our reward in heaven. Encircling the world are the words, the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. Reaching the people of this world with our message is the vision that drew us and bound us together. On behalf of the General Superintendent David K. Bernard, the Executive Board, the General Board, the officials of the United Pentecostal Church International, the officials of the South Texas District and the Texas District, our grateful ministers and saints, please accept this flag and certificate of honor for your family as a symbol of our appreciation and faithful and dedicated service as a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by Brother Carl Schusler. Amen.
Carl was here, he would say, can we just clap our hands to Jesus right now? Give praise to him. Is he worthy? There's nobody like Jesus. Actually said I told Brother Leatherwood, I said, hey, you said everything I was going to say. What am I going to do now? That speaks something of Carl Schuessler's life, the fact that everyone that has something to say about it just about has the, the same thing to say, a life of integrity. When I heard about his passing the other day, I knew that there would be a host of people at his funeral. Someone said he knew everyone. And it's true. He knew more people, I think, than anyone I'd ever met. And his list of contacts was a mile long. One of my life goals, Sister Pam, sometime was to introduce him to somebody that he didn't know. So I think I did that about twice. <laughs> Over the 18 years that we knew one another. And even when I would introduce him to someone that he didn't know, he would wind up just making that relationship flourish, and then he would introduce me to their friends. Carl had a huge personality. He loved people. He wasn't a respecter of persons. He had friends among those that were the most popular and the highest echelons of people, and then people that were forgotten and maybe that no one else knew. And I don't think that he just made people feel like they were his friends. They were his friends. Those people on his contact list, and those people that he prayed for, he truly loved him. I first met Paul, uh, I first met Carl at dinner, go figure, uh, through a mutual friend, Paul Rivero, and Carl loved food. He was an amazing cook. I almost, I think I got second place. I almost won a chili cook-off once with his recipe. I don't think I did it quite like he did. We got pretty close. His ability to give flavor and texture to food was similar to his ability to bring spice into life. I think we were eating Italian food on the evening we met, and at that time, Carl was still walking. He walked in with a cane. I remember some of our very first conversations. They were related to his passion for the gospel. He was passionate. I don't think that either of us imagined at the time that our friendship would grow to the place where we would be working together, and even the time that my wife and my children and I spent with him in downtown Houston as he and Pam labored to plant a church. But God has a way of interweaving the lives of his children in sometimes unexpected ways. When Carl and I talked, even the very first time we talked, and I can remember other times standing as he was sitting in his truck just talking and dreaming and Carl loved the things of God. He loved his pastor, the late Elder James Kilgore. You know, Elder Kil Kilgore came to preach multiple times at the couple of locations where Carl rented for his church plant in downtown. And as I thought about his love for his pastor, I remembered a sermon that Elder Kilgore preached at Texas Bible College years ago, something about three P's in a pod, just three things. There are three P's, and I, I thought of a lot of P's that would describe words that would describe Carl, but just three of them that I just want to share with you very briefly. He was passionate, he was playful, and he was prayerful. Carl loved to tell the story about when he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. His old email address, if you've ever gotten an email from him, was Fireboy, and I can't remember what the date was, but his email address was related to when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had been a child who rode the bus to church with his cousins. 
maybe siblings, I can't remember the exact story, but they would go to the Pentecostals of Pasadena for Sunday school. For some reasons, he and his cousins or his siblings or somebody, they got into a fight and his mom said, you're not going to embarrass me going to church, getting into a fight. You're not going anywhere. Carl could fight, couldn't he? And I think even when he was a kid, he could. He, he told me often about how as he grew up, after he grew up, he would go and he would sit in the parking lot of the Pentecostals of Pasadena and just think about his relationship with God and how he wasn't forgotten and how walking into those restaurants or one of those restaurants, sometimes Elder Glass would walk in there and he remembered Carl. He remembered that young man, that child that had once ridden the bus to church. God was moving in Carl's spirit. And when he finally did wind up at church and revival service and God filled him with the Holy Ghost, he loved to tell about how he said, it was like fire, Brother Josh. It was like fire burning in my soul. I think about that fire. I think about that passion and the way that he received such a mighty baptism of the Spirit. It filled him with passion and everything that Carl did, he did taking to heart what the writer of Ecclesiastes said. He did it with all his might. He was full of passion. Even as his muscles weakened over the years, his passion strengthened. He lived life to the fullest and I believe that he's living it and someone already said it to the fullest even right. Not only was Carl passionate, but he was also playful. He knew how to have fun and to live life with joy. We just smile at somebody right now. He threw the greatest parties. I've heard, I don't know if he would want me to tell this, he told it to me, but I've heard that he threw very big parties in high school. Costume parties around Halloween. And that's why he always, he hated Halloween after receiving the baptism of the Spirit. I've heard that he rented warehouses, that they were the happening places to be. And after Carl gave his life to the Lord, he still knew how to entertain guests, and he had that gift of hospitality. Someone said, I stayed with him for a while. We stayed in his home, stayed the night there. We spent time there. And many of you have the same testimony. And he was genuine and authentic to everyone that came there. And he always wanted you to feel welcome. He always served the best food. Some of you I saw at a Christmas party. I think it was last year. He loved having people over you know, and it wasn't just people. I couldn't remember the name of the German Shepherd next door. What was that German Shepherd's name, Pam? But I remember Carl even knew the animals in the neighborhood. <laughs> he knew how to fun, have fun. And he wasn't above playing a joke on you. I, I remember and I wrestled with telling this story and I know Probably some of you have a fun story, a, a story that brings laughter. And I can remember that after Carl received the spirit, he no longer drank alcohol. And during a trip that Pam took to Brazil a while back, my son and I stayed with Carl. And one night he was cooking and we were looking for something to drink. And a little while later, my son walked over and he said, here you go, dad. And he handed me a bottle of Mike's Hard Alcohol. Al Mike's Hard Lemonade. <laughs> I got to looking at it and I said, what is this? I think my son, Josh Jr. and Carl, they were already opening up and just about taking, uh, they might have even taken a few sips. I said, Carl, whoa, 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 whoa. You know what this is? Oh, someone had left some of Mike's Hard Lemonade that had been visiting for one of the parties that Carl had had and they had brought their own drinks and no one knew what it was and it was shoved somewhere way back in the back of the fridge and 
Josh Jr. found it, and suffice it to say, we, we poured it out. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Amen? Carl lived a joyful life. He knew how to laugh. I'm sure right now there's probably some laughter and some memories of laughter that are stirring in your hearts right now and you could say, yeah, I remember. There wasn't any need for Carl to substitute alcohol. He was full of the Spirit. Carl lived a life full, and my final P is because he was prayerful. He was passionate, he was playful, he was prayerful. Carl loved to pray. He was a prayer warrior. He loved connecting to those people that are prayer warriors. He knew them. We prayed together in his home. We prayed in prayer rooms. We prayed in his truck. We prayed at the top of parking garages in downtown Houston. We prayed for global missions. We prayed together for evangelists, North American missionaries. The list goes on. He loved prayer conferences. He believed in prayer. He was powerful because he prayed. He was connected because he prayed. I can't think of any other and better way just to remember Carl. I know we're moving on and there's something else after this. But can we just pray for a moment right now? God, we love you. Would you pray with me out loud the way Carl would have liked for you to pray? God, we love you. God, we thank you so much, Lord, for this wonderful life. Lord, we thank you for this passionate life. Lord, we thank you for this joyful life. Lord, and we thank you for this wonderful, prayerful life. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. God, for your comfort, for your grace, for your strength over every one of us, oh God, and especially Lord God, for Carl's family today and for Pam, Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus, Lord. God, we thank you that Carl's prayers live on. We thank you for it. He would say, would you worship the Lord right now in Jesus' name? I greet all of you from the island of Puerto Rico, and I greet all of you in Jesus' precious name. For those of you that may not know me, my name is Paul Rivera. I'm a missionary to Puerto Rico, and I met Reverend Carl Schusler in 1997. That was the year that I was born again of the water and of the Spirit, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. I tell you that because that is when I, where I met Carl. I met him at the altar of that church. If there was anything that defined Carl, it was his love. Carl loved life. Carl loved animals. Carl loved children. Carl loved food, and if you were ever around Carl, you know that he always had a story to tell. And if you were ever around Carl, you would have stories to tell too. I have many stories to tell, but more than the stories, I want to tell you about Carl's loves. I will only talk about three of his loves because I want to be brief. But the first thing that everyone knows that knew Carl Schusler is that Carl loved people. People held a magnetic force that Carl could not resist. He would approach anyone and everyone, always with a smile on his face. He loved to talk and listen and share his time with others. Carl never met a stranger. Time was of no consequence to him when it came to people. Sometimes it would be months in between our conversations, and regardless, he, we would just pick up wherever we left off. Carl always made time. He made time for people for big people, for young people, for little people. It was all the same to him. I remember when our kids were small, he would somehow manage to raise them all on his scooter, and then he would drive them around at full speed in zigzag motions, figure eights, and whatever else he could think of. And they would all squirm and laugh, including Carl. Carl loved God. As I mentioned, we met at an altar. I remember how after many services, people would just surround Carl. His love for God and his love for people were an irresistible combination. If for some reason you couldn't find Carl, well, just show up at church and look around the altar. Last but not least, Carl loved Pam. I remember the day that he first told me about Pam the Merchant. He was smitten and not afraid to admit it. From that day on, his life would never be the same. 
He could not thank God enough for the wonderful gift that he found in her. It's not hard to be sad here today because Carl will be missed. But I don't think Carl would put up with us being sad. I think Carl would want us to celebrate his life. The Bible says in Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. But precious in my sight is the light and life of those that are called by his name. And precious in my sight was the life and the friendship that I got to share with Carl Schusler. Our prayers and thoughts are with all of you and with all of the family. May the Lord richly bless every single one of you. sometimes delay, but I never thought of Carl as disabled, okay? He just took a little longer to get places, amen? But we had adventures, amen? Uh, Carl and Pam and my family, we'd go to Brenham and go tour the, the Bluebell factory and go see the sights there. We'd go eat tapas downtown just as a couple and, and spend time with Carl, enjoyed living, Carl enjoyed life because God had done something so special for him. Brother Carl loved um, this Acts 2.38, one God message. He was committed to this, to holiness, to all of the things that Brother Kilgore taught him. He absorbed it into him, into his soul, and he, he loved these things. He loved the truth. And Carl loved Pam. Whenever he would talk about Pam, he, 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 he'd, he'd sigh. I mean, he couldn't say Pam without letting out this big sigh of the realization of the blessing that Pam was in his life and how much he loved his wife. He, he always seemed like, a, like he was back at Sam Rayburn High School as a high schooler, you know, 
with puppy love and you know in his voice and his heart talking about Pam, the Demerchant family. He loved Pam's family like that they were his own. And Carl loved his pastor. I think that's one of the things we love being around each other because I think sometimes Carl and I realize we wore people out talking about Brother Kilgore. But when we got around each other, we were like, okay, we can talk about Pastor Kilgore as much as we want to each other and never get tired of it. In fact, like, please tell me another story. And we would just love sitting around talking about our pastor. In fact, if I don't think there was ever a time that we weren't around each other, that our conversation didn't somehow steer to Pastor Kilgore and how much he meant to us. And Carl loved people. I don't know of anybody outside of Brother Kilgore who loved people the way that Carl did. And I think that's probably his inheritance that he received from Brother Kilgore. More, much more than receiving a, a tangible item, which he did have some things but he really did inherit Pastor Kilgore's love. And he loved on people. You know, when I say that I was one of his dearest friends, I'm pretty sure there's so many of you that have the same feeling because he made you feel like one of his dearest friends in the world. And it didn't make you jealous because he had so much love for you. It's like, it was okay that he had, you know, a million other friends. And he loved people. He loved being a husband. He loved being a friend. He loved being a pastor. He loved being a foster parent. He did great as a foster parent. <clears throat> he loved um, the horses and the animals, and the German shepherds next door. And Carl, we, we were already talking about the Christmas party and whether he was going to be able to do it in the new house and these things. And this, this Christmas isn't going to feel the same because it, it just became something. We, my, my wife and my kids already knew, you know, don't forget, but we're going to get a call to go to the Schuster's house sometime in Christmas season and go there because Carl loved to entertain. Carl loved to show love to people. The Lord gave me a verse, and for me, this was Carl's life verse, John 1334. It says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And I can't think of another verse that personifies and describes Carl more than this verse. The day that God filled him with the Holy Ghost, the day that God put anointing into his life to become a minister. Carl exampled this verse better than any person I knew. And Carl truly was a loving friend. And I give thanks to the Lord that he is with the Lord right now. But this was a very hard uh, news for my family in our church. The Promised Church loved Brother Carl. Amen. And we still do. May the Lord bless you today.
And I remember several of us lingering and praying with him because of his sincerity, his hunger for the Holy Ghost. He was still walking with his little metal canes at the time, and I remember we lingered very late. I walked with him out to the truck, and um, I was amazed at his attitude and his outlook on life. And little did I know at the time what a giant that he would become in my life. Later, he received the Holy Ghost, and I remember him beginning to call me often. It was very important that I visit his mom. She still lived there in the house near the church. Our friendship became solid. When he met his sweet Pam, how thankful I was. Because as the other mom had made mention, there had been a few bumps in the road to find God's perfect choice for him. And we celebrated at that wedding. And what a wonderful team for Jesus they became. His passion for the kingdom of God was contagious. I was so thankful when I was able to work from home because our phone conversations were very lengthy. He could talk for hours about the early church. His hunger to experience the same things that they experienced in God stirred me. And I hungered for those things as well. His knowledge of the history of how the movement or revelation of the oneness of God unfolded in Texas amazed me. We could talk for hours about it. I could not seem to retain or recall um, the things that he shared. So every conversation was new again. He would add a little bit more. He would go a little deeper concerning this one and that one. And Oh, I loved it. I loved it. A lot of you, if you call him for prayer, I have a feeling that Sister and I received that same call. Uh, we loved praying with him. We would receive it, and then later we would get it through text. And when he began speaking about starting a work in the downtown area, it, it soon became my burden as well. The Authentic Revival Church, the R. We talked about authentic revival, and we experienced it. Sister Pam leading and singing in worship along with several others along the way. I met several anointed ministers. He was always hungry to have the ministry, the gifts of the Spirit, the operation of the gifts. I, I met uh, people like Brother Leva and, and, and those that he brought in, and oh, we prayed so many people through the Holy Ghost and powerful, powerful moves of God. Morning and evening service was in my home church and in the middle of the day on Sunday was the ark. Brother Carl had the biggest heart, as they've all said. I remember going with him to neighborhood centers and open air spaces, serving food, giving gifts, especially at Christmas. Not only did they want the authentic church, but they wanted authentic Christ. They wanted everybody to experience the real. There were so many counterfeits in the world. I remember I taught a session of the deliverance, and that was one of the, one of the subjects that I taught, was the counterfeit versus real. The world was so full, and we dealt with a lot of that down there. A lot of things we dealt with, and God moved in powerful ways. We moved to several areas, and it was amazing. And our phone conversations were prayer meetings. My world became so much bigger with Brother Carl in it. Some days he preached to me, and some days I preached to him. Our prayer experiences will forever change me. There were people joining us on a conference call in this present day from 7 to 8 that are people that Brother Carl has told them about me. And we pray on the phone, on a conference call every morning. I scroll, scroll through some of my recent texts of Brother Carl, and many of them were prayer requests. And I remember praying for that one and 
him call in and tell me about the big tree. And the request was for himself. They were just matter of fact. Never a hint of desiring pity. As I walked in today, Sister Pam greeted me and she said, well, you prayed him back from the brink of death many times. But this time, it was God's time. And I've got to agree with God. Well, the crawl had a unique way of making you look at yourself differently than was your normal custom. And I remember sharing with him things I saw in prayer. I remember his unique way of helping me to understand what God was saying. Never boastfully nor arrogant, but humbly magnifying Jesus as he always did. I'm sure many of you have had similar thoughts as I after receiving the text or the phone call of Brother Carl's departure from this earthly home. Immediately after our grief and our pain had lingered with us for a few moments, Jesus prompted me to bring hope. A song came to my mind. We can only imagine. And so I allowed God to play that in my imagination. I'm sure you've all done the same thing. And then I seem to hear him say, Oh, Sister Wilma, wait until you see this. First of all, I want to say a great big thank you to Pastor Shemansky and the Good Causes of the Woodlands. My new church family have been so wonderfully supportive during this time. They've been top notch, getting this all together, working hard to make it happen. Yeah, I really appreciate it, and those of you that are here. And to each and one that came here, I know you love Carl, that's why you're here. He loved you back, and I know you love me, and I know. My loss is just not my loss, it's yours. It was very dear to each one of you. To the family members, to friends, he made everybody feel like you were his best friend. And I'm not telling you something you don't know, but Carl was a great um, evangelizer. I mean, everywhere he went, he shared his testimony of how God saved him. And um, because of that, in his honor, I'm going to share how God saved me. He would have wanted me to do that, and so I want you to know my experience with God as well. Um, as many of you know, I was born and raised in Brazil to the Divergent family, but um, living for God is not, like, you know, it's not like a kingdom that's passed down. You have to have your own walk with God. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have a name and you become somebody. It's, it's personal. And um, my mom, who's here in the front row, she would take us kids to church all the time, and she would take us to prayer meetings every week during the week, and she would just drag us along. And um, it's not politically correct anymore. People think the kids get to have their own choice in life. No, mom used to take me every time. And um, I had a dream one night. I felt like I was left behind, that God had come from my family, and I was there, and I was scared. And so that time, mom drug me to to prayer meeting during the week, I uh, I was really getting more serious about wanting to seek God and, and to be saved and to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And uh, and I was praying and praying, and I just felt God so strong, and it just hit me, and I started just speaking in tongues. I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I was only eight years old. I got it in a prayer meeting, and um, I felt such love and such peace, and I felt so clean on the inside, and I loved everything. 
everybody. And it's just really funny because, you know, here I am, I'm 51 years old. I can remember back when I was eight, it was such a powerful experience. It was a unique and a separate experience. It wasn't like I accepted the Lord and it happened. It was totally unique and separate experience. And I was um, I was a little um, rambunctious little brat. And I had a habit of um, making fun of people. I could imitate people. I walk funny and just made fun of a lot of people. And um, when I got the Holy Ghost, they didn't believe that I got it. They thought I was making fun of somebody. You know, because I was a threat. But there was this other little girl that um, was in my life, and she was there too. And I tell you what, I absolutely hated her guts. I hated her. I hated her with a passion because she used to steal from me. She would take my stuff. And when I got the Holy Ghost, I felt such love for her. It was so powerful. It was so not me, you know. I knew this was God because I didn't have that in me yet to love her. It's like, you know, she was awful to me. But it totally changed my life. And um, I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, not in the name of the titles. You know, Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He didn't say in the titles. Those are titles to describe God. But get baptized in the name. And if you read, continue to read in the book of Acts, people were all baptized that way in the book of Acts. That's how you have the authority is in the name. You know, Jesus said that he would send the comforter. And that's what I have today. He had to leave so the comforter could come. So we call it the Holy Ghost. Because ghost means the spirit of a departed one. Spirit is okay. They say Holy Spirit. But Pentecostals say Holy Ghost because it's slightly more powerful. He had to leave before the ghost, you know, the Holy Ghost came. And he came on the day of Pentecost. Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom. He, gave it his, he delegated his authority to Peter. And Peter preached a message on the day of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he gave us the plan of salvation. And it says, repent and be baptized, every single one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the And we promise unto you and to your children and everybody that you are this for every one of us. Every one of us. Because Jesus said that we had to be born again of the water and of the spirit to right. enter into the kingdom of God. And that's yes. how it was. And if you read through the book of Acts, you'll find all about this experience. Yes. And so I wanted to share my testimony with you, I know I've been through difficult things in life, and everyone here has, and God has been my comfort and my strength through all those things, and it's a deep abiding comfort and peace, and it's joy. Joy is something that, it's deeper than happiness. Happiness is based on your circumstances. You know, I have happy times, you have happy times. We're up and we're down, and it's normal, but this is supernatural, supersedes that I have a deep undergirding strength down inside of me because I got it when I was eight years old and that kept me from a lot of struggles in life. I never had a desire to do drugs or do alcohol because I had something better. I had something so powerful, stronger, that keeps me going. And so I wanted to share that with you um, because I know he would have wanted to. And I'm going to sing this song um, that I want to share with you. It's called I Give You Jesus because I want to give to you what I have that keeps me, what kept him through a very difficult life. I lived with him. I saw his pain. I saw his struggles. And he would get very frustrated. But he had the Holy Ghost. He had that deep, abiding joy deep down inside. He wanted to share it with everyone that he met. And he did. Thank you. 
same time I did. We both worked at the Green Sheet here in Houston together. And uh, 
What's surprised me about Carl's death is how many of you know my story, but I don't know yours. And I'm, all I keep thinking is, what did he say? Because he knew me before Christ too. So I'm hoping that you can look at me with the correct eyes. I have been saved. I have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sister Schusler, you are an incredible woman. To stand up here and see. In fact, I believe that she deserves a standing ovation for the strength that she has shown over the years. Schusler. Our hearts were sad, saddened by the news of the passing of Brother Schusler. While we mourn because he is no longer with us, we also feel a great sense of victory because we know that his last enemy is coming. Brother Schusler was a great man of faith, a true servant at heart, and a passionate soul winner. This precious man of God blessed scores of people with his dedicated North American missions ministry. Only time and eternity will tell the complete story of his imprint upon the many hearts and lives that he touched and led to the foot of Calvary. He made a positive and true difference in his life's work. On behalf of the ministers of the Texas District, I want to extend to you, the beloved family and friends of Brother Schuster, our deepest sympathy. May the grace and peace of the Lord be a comfort to you in your time of grief. While we regret that we cannot attend his homegoing service, my wife and I wanted you to know that you are in our thoughts and prayers. Sincerely, Jeffrey Story, Texas District Superintendent. As I was thinking about Carl, it's so funny, everything that everybody's been saying has been so true. He came to me probably about three months ago and said, hey, when are we going to start another church? And I looked at him and I said, Brother Carl, I said, we can start another church, but then I'm going to be doing marriage counseling more than we're going to be doing home missions work. Because I understand how much work it is. This is a home missions work. Brother Carl started his home missions work in October 2010, and this home mission work started in January of 2011. We helped Brother Carl while he was at the Ark. I have stayed in contact with Brother Carl after we both received the Holy Ghost, and we have loved Brother Carl. Brother Carl and I go a long way back, and I think he loved me because I knew his story, and he knew mine. And I was thinking about what he would want me to preach, what he would want me to talk about, and I started thinking about his suffering. Nothing is more powerful than the man who puts his trust into the hands of God while being battered by physical adversity. Why did Carl continue to praise in the midst of suffering? Why didn't Carl give up a long time ago? Why did Carl have to suffer so much? Why was Carl's pain so prevalent? Why was Carl dealt the physical blow and setbacks within and without his body, which was racked with adversity? And as I started to think about all that Carl went through, I realized that Christ had a specific purpose for Carl's pain. Carl suffered so that the gospel of Jesus Christ could be propagated. Well, that's crazy to think that. Why would God cause somebody to suffer just to bring his gospel to somebody? I have Bible for that in Psalms chapter 119 and 67. David wrote, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept your word. And if you think that isn't strong enough, maybe you just go down four more verses where it says in verse 71, It is good for me 
that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. What statutes did Carl learn? What was so important that kept Carl propagating God's word yet riddled with pain? Well, one of the statutes that Carl learned was Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He, stuck, he suffered for the statute of salvation found in John chapter 3. Unless you are born again of the water and of the spirit, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He suffered for the statutes found in Isaiah chapter 53. Who have believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it was our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had not borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Carl suffered for many, many years to see a simple fulfillment found in Joel chapter 2. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream dreams, and your old men shall dream dreams, I'm sorry, and young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. He suffered to see that. Carl suffered for the statutes of Jesus Christ found in John chapter 7. In that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, that they which believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was yet not glorified. He suffered to make sure that he could see that. Carl suffered affliction so that people could experience the same statute that he experienced in Acts chapter 2. Thank you, sister, for sharing that. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise, the promise that Carl suffered for, the promise that he went through, all that he went through in his muscles and body, the promise that he understood was for him. He understood suffering for the statue. And Carl accepted suffering so that those statutes could be brought to you and I. Psalms chapter 22 and verse 24 said this about Carl's life. For he hath not despised nor borne the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Carl cried many times. I was with Carl a few times he cried because of the pain. I remember when Carl could walk. I remember when Carl didn't have a wheelchair. I remember the suffering that he started to go through as that happened. Carl cried, but in his cries, a merciful God answered. God knew that Carl loved the world. God knew that Carl loved good preaching. One of the greatest stories I heard this week was that Brother Carl would ask every top quote-unquote preacher in our movement, and he knew them all, to come preach for him. And somebody finally told him, you know, Brother Carl, you're going to have to, like, give them an opportunity to go preach at the big churches. 
Carl loved good preaching. Carl and God understood that Carl loved people. But God also knew that Carl was in pain. God knew that Carl was struggling even more in recent years. But God also understood that Carl knew the statute found in Romans chapter 8. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Yes, he suffered. And yes, he struggled. And yes, he dealt with pain. But he also understood that suffering for the statue was worthwhile because he would end up in glory one day and see his maker, the one that he had heard of, the one that he had talked to, the one that had given him his spirit. He knew that. As you stand today. There is no doubt. Brother Carl, Sister Pam, I'm telephone for a moment. He came to me and said, hey, I, I'm going I'm to build this house. I said, you better not. Well, I'm going to do it. That's what you're getting into. Oh, man. But you know what? He rode around that house thanking God. He rode around that foundation before there was a wall built thanking God. He rode through there before it was finished thanking God. There is no doubt that these past few years that Carl has been in pain and suffering like no other years. He was confined to that chair. That man, you never wanted that chair to roll over your foot. I'd get so close to him and he'd turn. I'd have to pray through him. I think sometimes he did that just for fun. Oops, sorry. Confined to a chair, struggling to move. Tormented by his motor skills, waning. Agonized by a continued reduction in his ability to function like you and I. He was living like a present day joke. He was living in Job's type of pain. But I went to Job's story. And in Job chapter 42 and verse 5, Job said this, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes had seen you. If Carl were here today and he would allow me to speak for him, I think he would tell us this. I know that you think this life I lived was nothing but suffering. And I know that you think that the pain was all I lived with. Some of you I know think that my lifestyle and my commitment to the statutes I learned are too hard to bear. But if I can suffer so that my soul is saved, it will be worth some suffering for me to see you on the other side of the world. Carl would say, I heard God call me many times, but now, Carl would tell us, will it be difficult? Maybe at first. But when you hear Jesus speak to 
to you through his spirit. When you hear the call of God ring in your ears, while it seems as if you're suffering so much, know this. I heard him tell me. It's your time, Carl. Come on. And because I suffered for the statutes, I can now see my Savior. I'm standing before the one who delivered me from my body. I'm standing before the one who set me free from my pain. I'm standing before the one I heard, and now I'm seeing him face to face. Carl had to go through suffering so that the statutes of the Lord would be so ingrained in his spirit. But what Carl really wanted was not to hear the Lord. He wanted to see him. He wanted to see him. He wanted to know that his suffering meant something. He wanted to know that his suffering was going to bring him to the place where he could look at him, his Savior, face to face. So, all of us, in some way, are suffering right now. Two weeks ago, Brother Carl said, I'm here, I'm ready. I said, I know, and I'm ready too. We're suffering. The church suffers. Sister Pan suffers. Friends, loved ones suffer. But if Carl would want anything, he would want our suffering to lead us to the voice of God. So let your suffering lead you. Let your suffering get you to the statutes that Carl suffer for. Let your suffering help you to reassess your relationship with God. And I guarantee Carl Allen Schuster would tell you it's worth it. It's worth the suffering to see As you bow your heads today, dear God, mighty, everlasting Father, Carl suffered. stay faithful. Carl dealt with physical adversities, but spiritually he was a giant, strong, mighty. God, you have taken a servant. You've taken this man taken our friend, a husband, a son, a brother. You've taken. But Lord, in our suffering, help us to see you. As we're suffering, God, help us to see where we're at. Yes, we've heard you. Yes, you called us time and time again, but today, Lord, we want to respond to you. Lord, 
Everyone in this room has got story after story. But God, let it be that the story of Carl Allen Schuster is not that he died on November 7th, but it is that he heard through his suffering your voice. And now, face to face, he sees you. And let it be that on this day, seven days later, that we too, Lord, if we're suffering, let it lead us to where we hear your voice and make plans to see you face to face. Bless every soul and every life. I pray right now, Lord, in your precious name, in Jesus' name. There is a private burial following this service. And as you remain standing right now, I'm going to ask the pallbearers to come forward. We're going to be exiting out of the family because we do have to get south relatively quickly. On behalf of the Schuster family, the Pentecostals of the Woodlands, and all those that have spoken here today, we honor you and say thank you for your kindness, your compassion, and your love. We ask you to keep Sister Pam in your prayers. And we ask you to keep this family close to heart. Please pray for this one. Oh, 